another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. I'm Taylor Haas, and you're Danny Shirey. I'm in Florida, you're in Pittsburgh. It's the trade deadline day. We have so much to talk about. There's there's no chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you, whether you think they're better or not, you can't say that this Penguins team is not a little different than they were at the yeah, start of so the Yeah, so Ron has to all get pretty active in the in days leading up to the deadline. Um, we're going to break it up. This segment, we're going to talk about the moves he made on Thursday, um, Thursday evening. So they traded Teddy Bluger to the Golden Knights. They got a uh, 2024 third-round draft pick back and defense prospect Peter Deliberatore. Um, Deliberatory, we're not gonna we're not gonna spend any time on this. He spent the season between the a- AHL and the ECHL, but um, I mean, well, no, it, it's it's not that just he's he's split the season between the the AHL and the ECHL. He spent the past like three or four seasons in the AHL, only to get demoted to the ECHL this season. So, um, if you have any hopes of him becoming your future Norris winner. Um, I might yeah, want to honestly, reconsider. and even knowing like Wilkes-Barre's depth, I don't even think that like coming here is going to start to age. I think this is going to be a like wheeling pushing for the Kelly Cup playoffs. You know, good for them. Um, but yeah, sending Bluger out. Um, they got the the draft pick back the same day. Um, they ac- acquired Mikhail Granlund um, from Nashville j- at the day after just playing Mikhail Granlund uh, in Nashville, um, just for a second round pick. Um, because they have they they have the cap space to do that, I guess. Um, starting with Granlund, I know like you wrote a column that night about you know just how I guess awful Granlund like that fit was going to be. How does it feel to be wrong? <laughs> hey, what am I, what exactly am I, I think, wrong? About? I, I liked him in his debut. Um, he, he made his debut the next night um, in Tampa. I I thought he was a good fit. I thought. Jeff Carter looked the best he's looked all season. I would hope Jeff Carter has a little bit of a fire under his butt after his two line mates got right? waved. No, but but just the way that like Gr- Granlund, uh, I mean, you know, they had no practice. They did have a full morning skate. You know, Heinen's the other guy on that line. I, the the way that Granlund was finding Carter all night, you know, he's like winning uh, puck battles in the corners, setting up Carter. Carter's firing it wide as he as one does. Um, but it just like off the bat, that line had great chem- the, the results that line had, like on ice, you know, expected they had the best like expected goals for percentage of any of the lines. And it's their first game together. They barely know each other. Um, they barely have any experience with each other. And they look good. Granlund, um, he had the most PK time of any forward. Yeah, it, it, I will say it was a little interesting to see Sullivan deploy Granlin like he was prime Patrice Bergeron there for a little bit. That was interesting, but I guess you got to do that to, to really figure out what kind of player you have. Um, but but just to play devil's advocate to the to the strong start that the third line had with him on there, um, you know, we, we've seen time and time again players that have spent a long time, uh, you know, with a, with their previous team or, you know, Granlin in Granlin's case, he spent his entire, I believe it's a 10, 11, 12 season career with two teams. And he's been with the predators here for several seasons. Now we've seen it before where a player that is recently traded goes on a little bit of a hot streak. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying that if you go on a hot streak, it's destined to, to come back to earth, but, um, you know, I'm, I don't know that I'm going to be sold on anything about Granlund in a Penguins uniform one way or the other until we have a little bit more of a sample size here. Um, and the reason I say that is, is based off a lot of the work I did in the, in the column that you were referring to. Um, Granlund, there was a point in time back in his Minnesota days when he, what I considered at least to be one of the more underrated um, guys around the league, at least up front uh, at the forward position. He wasn't a guy that put up ridiculous point totals, um, but he was one of those guys that you might consider like an analytics darling where he had really good possession impacts and generating offense. And on the inverse of that, he had really good impacts, limiting quality chances against. Well, over the past two seasons, his possession impacts at both ends of the rink have been like of in the basement of league forwards. I'm willing to admit and I almost am inclined to believe that those are going to see an uptick with the Penguins. But the other thing that kind of irks me a little bit is that Granlund, if if they truly plan on playing him on the third line with Jeff Carter and let's say it's Danton Heinen, 
I don't see his skill set over time being something that's going to make all that much of a difference on that line. What you brought up his passing ability and that he was finding Carter and that that is far and away the best thing that he brings to the table is his passing ability and specifically his passing ability in the offensive zone. But he's also not a huge transition guy. He doesn't skate the puck out of the zone or even into the zone a lot. And while he was engaged on the four check last night, he historically has not been very involved on the four check. You could make an argument that that has something to do with playing in a little bit more of a, a passive system in Nashville. Um, so I, I'm just very, very hesitant after one game where, you know, Jeff Carter finally looked like he had some wheels to be like, oh, yeah, this guy is great. With that being said, and I know I'm rambling here and you need to talk too, but, but um, I, the <laughs> – the, the the biggest the biggest problem with acquiring Granlund was that all this cap space came out of nowhere like it was gifted to Hextall gifted to him got out from under an, another season of Kasperi Kapanen got somebody to take Bluger off his hands McGinn's uh, half damn near half of his um, cap hit was buried down in the minors and. It goes to Granlund, who's got yeah, another two and, years. I mean, Patrick Alvin, you know, everyone was mm, Brock Besser, JT Miller. Alvin did say today that he didn't actually get an offer from anyone on JT Miller. So I don't think if the Penguins were having discussions on JT, because I think everyone thought that's where this was heading, just because with all the cap space the Penguins freed up, it was $5.5 million. What does JT Miller have? make uh you know just that much it seems like they were just clearing enough to take him on but that never really escalated anywhere I mean but good just going back to Granlin um when you went back to his days in, in Minnesota who was his line mate for the better part of six years in Minnesota Jason Zucker Jason Zucker Would, do you think that I mean Zucker they Zucker talked after um the morning skate in Nashville um after they acquired Mikhail Granlin and uh, he, he did say that Granlin's passing got him his contract that he has now. Like, Granlin got him paid. Yeah. And then Granlin talked after. Um, he asked if that was true. <laughs> like, did, did, you know, your, your passing get Zucker paid? He's like, well, I'm not going to deny it. Um, pretty funny. But, I mean, could you see something happen where um, Granlin goes up to the second line and plays with Zucker and maybe Russ goes down to the third line? Because just because he started on the third line doesn't mean that's where he's going to be. We've seen when new guys come in, especially when they haven't had a full practice yet. I mean, even going back to like Raquel last year, Raquel started on the third line just because, you know, he has to learn a whole new system, everything. Just easier to throw him in on the third line. Granlon, too, he's going to be on the power play at some point. They didn't start him on the power play. I know people were having hissy fits about that. But, like, they started him on the PK. They started him five on five. They can't put him on the power play, too. Um, that's just way too much to take on, too. But So he's going to be on the power play eventually. Probably Heinen's the guy that comes out. But could you also see him going to the top Yeah, Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, could, I would be surprised if Granlund and uh, a, a line with Malkin Center and Granlund and Zucker, I'd be surprised if that isn't explored at some point, especially because the top six has been like ridiculously healthy all season. Like most of those guys have played all season or only missed a handful of games, including Zucker. Um, but, but my thing with that is one, I don't know how much better the Malkin line can really get. Even if you consider this chemistry that that Zucker and Granlund had years ago, right? Like the the Zucker Malk and Russ line, they've been one of the best lines in the NHL this year at, at controlling possession and chances at both ends of the rink. Um, I'm not talking about improving I, the second line. I'm talking I, I, about I, like maybe that would be good for the third line, like putting Russ down there. Yeah, I mean. Is it going to be all that much different than Granlin there, though? Like, I, I, I like Rust. I don't, I don't have a problem with him at all, but I don't see him as, like, some impact piece that all of a sudden you put him on the third line and, like, there's some massive changes. And, and Rust, out of all the guys in the top six, probably drives play the least out of all six of those guys. Yeah. I mean, I guess we'll see. I'm sure we'll see a bunch of line combinations. Just also losing Teddy, uh, Teddy Bluger to Vegas. Uh, first of all, best of luck in Teddy uh to teddy in vegas i i shot him a text after just getting a guy going back to you know when i started writing that wilkes and like the, the group of guys that came up that season teddy was is 
kind of like one of the last guys left in that group that I that I started covering when they were down in Wolf's Bay. I remember talking to him. Um, I did a number of features on him before he got his NHL debut, and it, he was down there ready for the longest time and just not getting a shot up here. And I remember talking to him. like He was like openly frustrated about it. And just really nice to see him get um, – carve himself a rollout up up here I, I text him like so like you know nice to follow his little path over the years he said uh he's gonna he really enjoyed his time in Pittsburgh he's really gonna miss it um uh nice guy but just what biggest challenge is replacing him I think it's gonna be I mean the PKing but also taking the face-offs on the penalty kill but going back to Granlin they had Granlin taking the face-offs on the penalty kill in Teddy's place yeah, which which was interesting because Granlund is is not a very good faceoff guy. Like I think he's at like forty, he's right below forty four percent this year. And I think of of his like twelve NHL seasons, he's only had three where he was above fifty percent. So and that without going back down another rabbit hole here, that just brings me back to the whole fit with Granlund thing. Like I I was of the opinion that the biggest need on this team was a third line center and getting Jeff Carter out of that role. And it's like. You got Ron Hextall sitting here was like, well, where's Granlin going to play? That's up to Sully. It's like you didn't target a guy that's going to address your direct yeah. oh, needs. I mean, Granlin also could step in at center too. But again, if you're going to bring a guy in, no practice and, you know, new system, everything like that, it would be easier. It's easier to ease him in on the wing than it is at, at, at center. Oh yeah, I, I'm not necessarily talking about his debut. Like I, I knew coming in that they were going to ease him into things and and might not be utilizing him the way that they plan to over the long term. Um, but you know, again, I it it struck me a little bit when Hextall straight up said, you know, I'm you know I just want to give uh, Mike Sullivan the the flexibility and the versatility to kind of do what he pleases with his line combos, and it's like, okay. Um. Nice guy. During COVID, I took, um, I made it pretty far into the Duolingo Finnish courses, and like then I, I stopped doing it, and like work started back up. All that's really uh, that I've really gotten out of that is um, the word Kisa means cat, and when my parents got a cat, I was giving like name suggestions of like Kisa. They named it Kisa, so they named their cat Cat. And then the other thing I retained is thank you is the Ketos. So like anytime I talk to a Finnish player now, I say like Ketos after. Granlin got a real kick out of that, but um, nice. You're giving Emily cat. Yeah. Oh yeah, money. she does that with everyone. I only, <laughs> I mean, know it in uh, Finnish and I guess English. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a break here. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about the moves the Penguins made on Friday. So stick with us. All right, and we are back. The Penguins were done. Um, they made a couple of trades on Friday leading up to the 3 p.m. trade deadline. Uh, they acquired Dmitry Kulikov from the Ducks, left-handed defenseman. In exchange, they sent out Brock McGinn and a third-round pick. Um, Ducks are retaining 50% of Kulikov's uh, cap hit, $2.25 million. It expires this year. It's an expiring contract. First of all, Brock McGinn going out. Brock McGinn has obviously he had cleared waivers he was assigned to Wilkes-Barre he didn't actually physically make it there yet because I think the plan always was to move him out him clearing waivers actually made him very um even more appealing as a trade target because now any team acquiring him can just put him in the minors too but um I mean just first of all Brock McGinn clearing that you know because he has 2.75 million cap it for two more years just getting that out um, good move to, by Hexball to undo that mistake, like he undid the Kapanen mistake. But as far as Kulikov goes, um, they have 10 NHL caliber defensemen. Do you think that's enough, or do you think they should have gone 12 and so they can dress 12 D6 forwards? Well, uh, <laughs> I, it's becoming increasingly apparent that the uh, way to solve the issues in the bottom six is actually just dressing a bunch of defensemen there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it, it was funny because when I, when I saw – the official Kulikov trade come through, like it was all said and done. The Penguins like tweeted it out and sent us an email. And that's, you know, that's how, you know, it's, it's happening. And well, at that point I'm like, okay, like somebody like Dumoulin or Pedersen or maybe even Joseph here, like one of these other left-handed defensemen are going to get moved out. Like there's no way they're going to carry that many guys. Well, the deadline rolls around. You don't really hear anything. And Ron Hextall speaking an hour after the deadline, 
then you know you're on your way to cranberry to upmc 66 and then nothing else is happening and then it's five minutes from go time and you're like all right well this is it and i i asked hext all about it i was like was the plan for you when you acquired kulikov to try and or at least you had hopes of maybe moving another one of those defensemen before the deadline happened and he was like no xavier well let's hurt down in the ahl we had to get some depth which is just as some of the covers books barry <laughs> that's that's i don't understand that at all because Xavier like, of the call up like the depth chart in Wilkesbury, you got Friedman, Smith, Fadoon, and like Ulet. Like he was not coming up. Ule, I think it's well, actually here, here's the, he's, he's done here's, for the year. He had an ankle surgery, but like that. Yeah, was, here's here's the other thing though. Like Kulikov's not going to the AHL anyway, so I no, like. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that I necessarily expected Hextall to be like, yeah, we wanted to really move one of these guys but couldn't get it in under the wire. Like, I, I don't know that any GM would actually come out and say that. You're um, right now. <laughs> yeah, but at, at the same time, it's like, dude, you've literally – the guy you got as your centerpiece in a return for a, a John Marino trade and sending him to the Devils, the centerpiece of that return has been buried in the minor leagues for all of nine games this season because you haven't had enough cap space or the roster spots to bring him up. And now I'm I'm not some Ty Smith warrior here that thinks he should be in the lineup or, or whatever. I, I'm honestly quite – not really sure what to make of him as, a, as an NHL player at this point because he's been in the minors all year. And and he's not coming up anytime soon. I, Hexel mentioned this. Too. So I, you know, read Red Wolves Um He took a puck to the face uh, two weeks ago now. He ended up coming back to that game, like, full sh- with just with the full shield. He looked awful. Like, his, it hit him in the mouth. Like, it was, so, like, that area, that was real swollen. Um, he missed the next game, they said, for some dental work. And then... He missed the next couple. They said, like, no update, no timetable. And then um, I believe it was Tuesday or Wednesday. They said he's now week to week. So Ty Smith isn't an option anytime soon. But, I mean, uh, but again, Ty Smith was in the minors anyway. Just looking at the – and the roster limit is no longer a problem because the 23-man roster limit goes away at, at the trade deadline. So as long as they can fit Kulikov in cap-wise, and they can, then, you know, he, he can – we can stay up it's not an issue but i mean if he's playing on the left side you look at who they have on the left <laughs> well it's it's Patterson, it's like one joseph yeah one of one of those guys is getting him. scratched or or is is he even better than any of those three i'm not convinced that he is um, is he um well here's the thing and i i don't know that it we planned on talking about this but like kulikov has been playing on a god awful Ducks team this year. Like yeah. the duck, the Ducks team is this year's Ducks team is like far and away the worst defensive team that we have in in the stats era, which is dating back to like the 07, 08 season. Aside from this season, Kulikov has a long track record of having pretty – nothing spectacular, but he's had pretty good defensive impacts and at times has even had solid impacts – uh, offensively where he's helping his team generate chances at above an above league average rate. Well, this season the ducks are like, Oh, well let's take this borderline second pairing defenseman and make him our top pairing defenseman. Cause he's had good results in that role before. Well, that hasn't happened. And I, I, quite frankly, don't know if he's been playing a whole lot with John Klingberg or not, but John Klingberg has quite literally been the worst defensive player in all of hockey this season. So that right then and there is also going to have impacts on Kulikov, even though and I'm the biggest analytics proponent out there. But I even I will tell you that these models that, you know, say they're isolating an impact, they are still influenced by your environment and contextual factors like playing with John Klingberg. So if, you, if you're looking at the J Fresh card or, or Dom Lucision's player card, you might look at it and you're like, holy crap, Kulikov's frigging god-awful. I'm not so convinced he's god-awful, and I actually think he can help the Penguins a little bit defensively. Um, he's got a little bit of mobility for his size. Um, but th- then again, you look at who they have, and it's like, do you want to sit Joseph? He's been yeah, one of their better off. Especially he's been with- one of their better offensive guys. Kulikov being a pending UFA, Joseph Young, Joseph has a future here. Right. I don't know if you want to take Joseph out. Regardless, moving on, because they made another maybe bigger trade on Friday. Oh, bring Benino, back- Benino, 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 Benino! Yeah, bring back Nick Benino. Um, 
it was a it, it, very com- this trade took all day like leading up to it because it's, it is complicated they had to get it's so they got Benino from the Sharks they had to get Montreal in to retain salary Benino's another pending UFA um so all, right, well, let me let, let me read the entire trade details. Well, I mean, most of the complicated details are San Jose and Montreal going back and forth with like picks and prospects, which nobody listening to this cares about. Arvid Henderson or Tony Sund. I don't know who those people <sighs> are. <laughs> like they're <laughs> the Sharks and Canadians. That's they're they're not relevant for the conversation. But no, I I, I have it in front of me. Um. All the Penguins sent out was a conditional fifth round pick in 2024 and a seventh round pick in 2023. And so the Canadians are the middleman retaining 50%. So Benino only counts um, one, a little over 1 million. Um, right. the, con- the conditions on the conditional pick. Um, so it's a conditional fifth round pick. If the Penguins make the Eastern mm-hmm. Conference finals, then that gets upgraded to a, a fourth round pick this the same year. So, I, I thought it was interesting that Hexel did, you know, note kind of right away that, so Benino, obviously center, center of the HBK line. He did note that Benino can play, he's like, well, he's played a lot of wing this year. So like, where does Benino fit in? You figure he's going to play center, but I thought it was weird that Hexel was like, well, but he could play wing too. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sold or, or I guess sure is the right word of what their plans are for Benino. Cause like, Initially, it's like, yeah, you don't really want him as your third line center, um, but he has played some wing this year, so I don't know if they maybe plan on throwing him on the left side of that line with Carter and Granlund. Or, um, you know, we've both talked about how you know Mike Sullivan doesn't really love the idea of Drew O'Connor up the middle, even though he will play them there, like he did. He's the other outright night. said like on five separate occasions that they like O'Connor at the wing. right. <laughs> Right. So yeah. combine, combining that with the fact that Ryan Paling's nagging upper body injury seems like it's going to nag for the rest of the season and into the off season because this has been going on for months now, mm-hmm. which stinks because Paling's been really good when he's in the lineup, but he gets in the lineup for two or three games and then he's right back out with the same injury. Yeah. Um, so a quick Paling, um, he he skated. He he was cleared for contact in Nashville that morning. Skate. Um, he was a full participant. He was not out there the following day for practice. He, um, we asked Sullivan about it, or the morning skate. He, Sullivan said he did take a step back after he did have, um, after he was a full participant. I, this this feels, and like I talked to Palin after that. I was the only one that talked to him after that morning skate in Nashville too. Is how he feels, and he's like, oh, it feel great. And, um, and then, so he's been dealing with it. We don't know exactly what the injury is. He's been dealing with it. Um, the first game he missed was in December, December 20th. I talked to him after that. He said what has been nagging him that actually had him come out on December 20th. He actually suffered on December 1st. And he said initially they didn't know what it was. So, like, he came out and missed some time. And they came back in. And then they realized what it was. And then now they have some direction. But then he's been out, what, for, like, a month now. Um and yeah, I, t- I talked to him after the skate. He said he was feeling good. He sounded like he was getting close to return. I did say, is this a, because this feels so much like a situation where like he's just kind of trying to find a way to play through the pain. And then the day after the Penguins season ends, we're going to get a press release that says like Ryan Penning's undergone successful whatever surgery mm-hmm. and he's going to be out. You know, I, that feels like when this is going to happen. So I asked him and I was like, is this thing where you are just trying to manage the pain? And once the summer comes, you're going to have to maybe have surgery or like rehab it. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. So it, it's just a very weird situation. But even after you know, he took a step back, Sullivan sounded like he was still a possibility to come back relatively soon, like before the playoffs at least. And then Paling well, did come out and skate on Friday um, for the Penguins practice in Coral Springs. Not a full participant in practice, but he came out at the end and was out there for a long time. Yeah, so just just going back to Benino, like I I think that they're they they obviously had plans to like kind of f- have Paling fill Bluger's role that he was in on as the fourth line center and filling in on the penalty kill, um, but obviously if if he's not available to do so, they're going to need someone else, and the next guy up was Drew O'Connor. So I'm led to believe that they want Nick Benino in that spot. And the thing about Benino, I don't know that you necessarily want him playing in a role that's 
anything other than on your fourth line at this point. Um, you know, he, he never been a great skater, was not a great skater, even when he was playing pretty well with the Penguins back when they won cups. Um, and I, I, I covered both, uh, both games against the Sharks that the Penguins played against him this year. And I just remember being like struck by how bad his skating is like his, his legs are cooked. His legs are cooked. That being said, I'm not saying this was, this was a bad trade. I, I think it was kind of a good move. Um, he, he can, he can still give you the, the defensive impacts that you need. I don't know that he's going to bring a whole lot to the table offensively, but neither was Teddy Bluger. So um, I, I, I think he'll be fine. Um, but again, like Granlund, I just don't know, don't know how much this moves the needle. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. So Benino um, is expected to play uh, Saturday in uh, Florida. So we'll see. We'll they're not going to have a morning skate, so because it's a six o'clock start, so we're going to find out uh, game time where he's going to fit in, how they plan on using him. Uh, but yeah, just interesting. It's only for the vibes, getting the band back together. <laughs> um, honestly, but so like I like I said, I cover the practice Penguins practice in Coral Springs today. I saw like Crosby and Latang talking to a guy off to the side. I'm like, who is that? And they turn around and say like, it's Patrick Marleau. I was like, hey. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Patrick Marleau retired. But um, I did funny Patrick Marleau story to you know they required him the COVID year to um, Friday March third. Actually, the three-year anniversary of the time Crosby decided to switch up the order they come out of the tunnel for the first time since he's been on the team. Because obviously, um, you know, Letang, it's coming out of the tunnel for warm-ups, you know, the start of the game. It always goes Latang, Crosby, Malkin comes out last. Malkin and Latang, I mean, Malkin and Crosby when they came in. Um, when Malkin came in, you know, he wanted to come out last. Crosby had been coming out last. Malcolm was like, well, me three years Super League because he had played three years in Russia. He had he had the experience over Crosby, so Malkin takes seniority. That's why he comes out last. But Latang had always been the guy coming out in front of Sid. But, you know, the Peng- when the Penguins brought in Marlowe three years ago, they, they had lost a couple games in a row. Marlowe, veteran, very respected guy, Hall of Famer, he's going to be. Crosby is like... We're gonna switch things up here. He he asked Marlo to move in the order to come out. So it goes Latang, Marlo, Crosby, Malkin. And I remember when we saw that happen at the time for the game when they did that. Everyone in the press box is like, "This is insane." <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Crosby and his superstitions, um, but so I think they won their first maybe two games like that. And we talked to Marlo and Marlo is like, yeah, I'm just lining up where Sid tells me. Um, <laughs> and then, but then they lost a couple of games in a row. And then we started seeing like Marlo. And that was the out. end of that. <laughs> yeah, Sid's like, I've seen enough. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta move. But all I have to say about Patrick Marlo is that, what is that? Three years ago now that he was yeah. with the Penguins, two and a half years ago, I would hate to see what his legs look like now and what his skating <laughs> looks like now. Yeah. And um, that is all I have to say about Patrick Marlowe. I would love to see what Yager's legs look like on the other hand. He can <laughs> put a point in the check lead. If we're going for retreads with Benino, I don't know. Yager bring back the minor power play. What could have hurt? Probably a lot, but... Um, <laughs> we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take a break. All right, and we're back. And, you know, this third segment we try to save for more just, like, I don't know, fun stuff, takeaways, general thoughts on um, things that have been happening recently. And I just have to say, if Chris Letang does not win the Masterton Trophy this year, I'm going to eat my shoe. Just, I mean, first of all, everything he's been through this year. He obviously had the stroke, and he was back in no time. Losing his dad, that's been big. But just... He it's insane. What prompted this is um, the game in Tampa, first period. He takes he gets hit with two pucks. Um, he's defending the net front. Tampa has the net. They're in the Penguins end. Um, he gets hit in the hand, and he's obviously in a ton of pain. But he's just battling to stay out there because there's no way for him to get off. Um, he does. It's I think it was his right hand. He didn't even have it on his 
stick. He couldn't hold his stick. And then so while he's already, you know, in this position fighting through that, um, Tanner Janot takes a shot. It goes straight into Latang's mouth and then go deflects off Latang's mouth into Ross Colton and past Jari. Latang, you know, lightning or celebrating, Latang's face down on the ice. He gets up. There's a ton of blood. There's a trail of blood. They had to have a stoppage to clean it up. Latang obviously goes straight to the locker room. I didn't think he'd be back just as bad as that looked and knowing where it hit him. But then, you know, start of the second period, he's not there. But then a couple of minutes into the second period, he just skates on the ice for like a like normal shift and no cage, no full shield. His lip looks awful. They show him on the broadcast sitting on the bench. He has like ice in a towel and he's just holding it to his face between um between you know shifts. His lip his lip looks awful. I ran into him after the game. Um, you know, he's talking to the doctors and he comes out. Lip, it's clear he got a ton of stitches. Well, first I'm like, where did the first shot hit you? And he's he showed me his hand. His hands were his fingers wrapped up. It's one of his fingers. He's like, it 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 got cut open. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, how many stitches did you get in your lip? And he's like, no big 24. deal. 24 stitches. Like, it was nothing. Like, I'm asking him about a stub toe or a paper cut. And it's nothing. And then, yeah, he's back out um, playing his practice today, Friday. He was on the ice, no shield or anything like that. He talked after. Because, um, you know, I asked him just how he felt um, on Thursday. And he said, you know, just numb now, probably a little bit of pain tomorrow. And he said, yeah, it didn't feel good on Friday. Um, he said he couldn't laugh. And he also said that he's probably going to have to buy Jari dinner because the puck went off of his face into Colton into the net. Um, but just what what is – how is Chris saying the way I, he is? I don't know. Like he, he just really can't catch a – I mean, I guess it is catching a break that this puck catching him in the face didn't end up yeah. worse. Um, but to your point, like he, he, he had the stroke earlier in the season, comes back like insanely fast, and everybody's like, this dude's a friggin' warrior. Like Ron Hextall and Mike Sullivan are both talking about how he wanted back on the ice like the literal day after this happened. So then he comes back and plays a handful of games and then gets hurt and suffers a lower body injury. I believe it was against the Red Wings. Uh, and this was right before mm-hmm. the Winter Classic happened in Boston at the start of the year. Um, and then all of a sudden in Boston, his, his father passes away and, you know, obviously that happening in the middle of the season after you've just had a stroke and just suffered an injury is, is just crushing. But then on top of that, Latang then has to rehab for, what was it? Another three, four weeks afterward from that lower body injury and then came back. And, um, I, I think he's only missed was it one game since um, he had like a, he was out with illness or something, but regardless after this happens, it's just like, Oh my God, like put that dude in bubble wrap or something. Like it's, it's not even that like, Oh, we need you in the lineup. Like, yes, the Penguins need him in the lineup, but it's just like, it's almost concerning for the dude's well being. Yeah. He's, he's a warrior. I, I asked Sullivan after the game in Tampa, like, were you surprised to see Latang come back out? Cause even knowing Latang and how he battles through everything, I, there was a lot of blood on the ice. There's like two pools, a full, you know, and I, I, I don't have any stitches for him to come back out. No shield. But yes, I asked Sullivan, was he surprised? And he's like, no, no. Um, you know, just Latang, he said called him ultra competitive. He says he has the heart of a lion. Um, so yeah, that's just that's just how Latang is. But yeah, for him to just be so like nonchalant about it after afterwards too. Uh just insane. He's he's had such a tough year. He mastered him as the perseverance, dedication hockey. If he doesn't I, I don't know I think enough about what other guys have gone through across the league, but it, at least, you know, like the there's normally like a few contenders, I think, this time of year for like the Masters. And you know what guys are, are going through if there's anything significant. And there's no one that stands up to the Tang. He's 100% going to be the Penguins nominee. He should be a finalist. He should, I would say, win it. So um, this other takeaways from this trip, it is the dad's trip. It, it was the dad's trip. It started the last game at home against the Blues. The dads came to Nashville. They came to Tampa. They didn't come to 
um, sunrise because there's, n- I don't know why they didn't, but there's nothing to do here. This is not a fun place to be. Um, we're in the swamp, but Bob Grove has the stats. He says the penguins all time, 14, seven and three on dad's trips. Uh, Sullivan said after the game in Tampa that they might have to bring the dads along. I don't think they actually did. He, he actually said Crosby might have something to say about that, knowing Crosby. Crosby runs the best come, but are um, the dads the whether key? or not the dads are the key or not, I'm going to vote no on the dad's trip being full time <laughs> or happening at a higher frequency because I don't know that I'm going to be able to handle watching another game where every time there is a stoppage, the camera pans to the dads. Like, I, I think it's awesome. I, I used to love when my dad would come watch me play hockey. And I, if I were in the NHL, I, you can bet your butt that I would want my pops there. And I think, I think that's friggin' awesome. Guess what? I know it's the dad's trip. You don't have to show me every single time there's an offside. Every single time you come back from commercial break. Hey, it's it's the dad's trip. That's Jeff Petrie's dad. Did you know Jeff Petrie has scored twice tonight? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I thought it was cool being around. Um, uh, I, I I met a couple of the dads. P.O. Joseph's dad, very nice. Dan Heinen. I Ricard Raquel's dad said he sometimes listens to the podcast. So shout out to Roland if he's actually listening to this. We need to talk. Um, we need to talk about was, Marcus Pedersen's father. That's what I was just about to say because so I I saw him. You know, only two Swedes on the team are Raquel's dad and Pedersen's dad, and you know they're they're, they're hanging around each other. So I saw his Pedersen's, you know, but I'm. I saw him at the morning skate in Nashville and I was like, you know, because some of these dad's trips other teams do, they call it like a mentor's trip. So if it's like if your dad can't come, someone else like in a similar role comes or something. So like sometimes maybe a big brother. So I'm like, did Patterson's brother come? But then like the Penguins put out a video where they labeled him his dad. And I'm like, really? And then, so what you're talking about, Jeff Petrie scores two goals and you know, they cut to the, the dad box. In front, like a guy like stands up, celebrates, you turn turn around, you see like Pedersen on the back. And I'm I'm getting a ton of tweets like, is that Pedersen's brother? Why is Pedersen's brother there? I'm like, no, that's his dad. <laughs> and then I'm like, dang, how old did his name like Daniel? How old did he have Marcus? When and I looked up, he's 53 years old. He played um he had a long career himself in, in Sweden. He played center. Maybe they could have gotten him for cheaper than they got Bonino. <laughs> like I'm like I I I, I talked so I talked to Marcus after that game in Tampa um because he had insane assists yeah, to set up that, that first Zucker goal. Um yeah, the Murphy dump just perfectly landed. He he ended up downplaying and he's like honestly, he's like the ice was kind of beat up. That mm. helped me a little. It slowed it down so I could get to the Zucker. I, whatever. But like so I talked to him about that, but then when you're done talking, I was like, Is that your dad on this trip? And he's like yeah. And I was like, he looks so young. Um, I was like, I thought it was your brother. And I was like, they shut on the broadcast and Twitter's like, why is Marcus's brother here? I was like, everyone's talking about how young your dad looks. And he's like, he's like, oh, don't let him hear that. <laughs> like, he doesn't need to be hearing that. But yeah, just that was honestly the highlight, like one of the highlights of the. If you Google Marcus Pedersen now, the first like auto suggestion is Marcus Pedersen dad. <laughs> yeah, Taking I mean, I'm I'm not even trying to exaggerate here when I say he legitimately looks like he's not a day over like thirty. Yeah, it, it, insane. But uh, yeah, that was cool. Um, Pio Joseph said, I thought you know he was cool. He was um, he like took over as like the team photographer. He's like taken, he's documenting the whole trip. A- after after games, he's outside the locker. He's fist bumping everyone that walks by. He was fist bumping me, other other writers. Um, they had Dayton Heinen's dad, um, Richard, like take over as like a Pence TV camera guy. Um, he did a cool thing. I I like all the dad content. We were just talking about this. They did it at kind of dumb time of year, but the players chose when to do it because, you know, you want to take the dads some more fun. Um, and also like a trip, like the California trip is a little long for a dad's trip. Ideally it's like a two, three game trip. There, there weren't many options to do this as a dad's trip. But, At the know, same just, time, I'm just thinking, I don't even know how the week of the trade deadline is considered an option. 
That is insane. Teddy Bluger was like, yeah, what? Brian Burke called yeah. me and my dad into the office to tell me I got traded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, you know, so Teddy, yeah, Teddy's dad was here, obviously flew all the way from Riga, Latvia for this. Um, had his dad's trip cut short. He, he, um, he came for a dad's dad trip and ended up having to move his son across the country. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Brock McGinn and Mark Friedman's dads were here. They obviously got sent down. Um, I don't believe neither of them actually reported during that time, but it did end the dad's trip. Now, so Mark, uh, Brock McGinn got got traded. Mark Friedman, I believe, now that everything's settled, well, he's going to report to Wilkesbury. Wilkesbury's dad's trip is underway. So uh, Mark Friedman's dad maybe gets a double dad trip out of this. Um, good for him. But I I saw I. I that first day he was there in Nashville, we were like in the locker room. Um, me and another reporter were trying to figure out like who we we're going to talk to. Um, I was like, I think I'm like, uh, you know, we're going back and forth. And Mark Friedman said, I was like, talk <sighs> to Mark Friedman. Oh, so I don't know what a family, but 14, seven and three. Um, they, this was the first dad's trip they did since 2020, obviously COVID and everything. The year before that, they did a mom's trip. Um, they went one and one on the mom's trip. I think they're due for a mom's trip next year. So um, last night, oh, in Tampa. So oh, like going up to the press box in Tampa, there's a, there's a big elevator. So I'm waiting to go. The same elevator goes to the suites. It goes to the press box. I'm waiting to go up to the press box. All the dads come in. And it's like a ton of them because it's not just the team. It's like the support staff dads, like equipment guys, trainers, PR, social, all their dads are there. And I'm like, this is a lot of dads. I'm like, I might have to wait for the next elevator. P.O. Joseph's dad insisted. He's like, oh, no, you go ahead of me. We all ended up fitting. But Tony Esposito was there. And the dads fanboyed <laughs> Tony Esposito. They were so smart. <laughs> like, um, Jeff Carter's dad, especially. Jeff Jeff Carter, he's, you know, he introduced me. He's like, I'm Jim Carter. He's like, my son played for the Sioux Great. <laughs> like, and it's, like, very cool to see all the dads so hyped <laughs> to meet him. Like, I feel like that was maybe, like, the highlight of their trip. Um the way they they were crowding it around fun, him. So. Fun stuff. We we I love know. the dads. We just see. don't love the incessant camera pans on the broadcast. <laughs> oh, I I liked it. I don't know. I thought I thought it was funny. I, I I'm also not watching the broadcast. I was at the games for that, but I I don't know. It was cool. I like all the dad content. It would probably be less um, obtrusive if it weren't right. during the, the trade deadline. So maybe better dads trip next year, um, but. That's it for this. We've run pretty long. Um, if uh, if you're new to us, we drop new episodes every Saturday here at Podcast on Fifth Ave, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, Audible, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're also now back on YouTube. So if you want to watch this, if that's appealing to you for whatever reason, we're on the DK Pittsburgh Sports YouTube page. So if you subscribe to us there, you can watch our podcast and we drop every Saturday. We'll hope you can join us for future episodes. Thanks again for joining us.